Welcome to our 10th live webinar in our Keeping Members Connected series. Today, an historic webinar as we are launching Academia at Workplace Pride. And this is the inaugural webinar. Workplace Pride has grown. 10 years ago, we had seven members. Today, we have 70. And many of the new members are academic members, like Leiden University, Tilburg, Delft, Saxion, NWO, LUMC, for instance. So today we're addressing what is the unique perspective on LGBTI inclusion at universities and research organizations. My name is Michiel Kolman. I'm a senior vice president at Elsevier, but more importantly, I'm co-chair of Workplace Pride. I am joined today by a stellar panel. First, we have Professor Annetje Otto, who is vice president at the University of Utrecht. Annetje has a background in law, First started in Leiden, then at the University of Amsterdam. She was dean at uh, Utrecht and now vice president and will start next year as the president of Leiden University. Next, we have Lyle, who studied political science at the University of Amsterdam and was a true activist, for instance, for people with HIV and sex workers. He was also chair of the youth branch of GroenLinks, one of the leading political parties in the Netherlands. And we have Jojanneke van der Toorn, assistant professor at Utrecht in social and organizational psychology. Jojanneke tries to bridge science and society to achieve effective evidence-based diversity policies. More importantly, Jojanneke is professor for our chair, the Workplace Pride Chair for LGBT Workplace Inclusion in Leiden. So for this session, we did not record exactly from the beginning, but do join me. We will dive in right in the hot discussion about different lenses of diversity. We really love to do that. We have to be very careful with what we do. So combining forces has many, many advantages instead of all the isolated groups and, and different issues. So I find it in, in practice a real dilemma. So it's a bit of tension so between the uh, broad DNI policy and then focusing on specific lenses of DNI, whether it's around gender or sexuality or, or race or, or race. Or harassment or other groups, yeah. Gender, yeah. Well, Anything I can jump else? into that. Yeah, yeah please. Because uh, I well. think in terms of inclusion and diversity, it's really important that you have self-organization, right? Because if you want to make a group visible within an institution, it's very important that the group has the tools and the uh, uh, facilities to be able to auto-organize amongst people that belong to this group. Um, so I think that's a fundamental condition to any process of emancipation, uh, be it in a, com uh, in a company or a higher education institution or within a society. Um, uh, if in terms of resources, I think maybe this is also something um, that, uh, you know, and, and the national government should uh, could jump in uh, if indeed we see that there is still a long uh, way to go uh, for emancipation for many groups within higher education institutions, not just uh, LGBT people. Maybe then uh, there could be some support from the national government to be able to finance those projects. But the fact that groups uh, need to have some form of auto-emancipation, uh, auto-organization uh, to uh, get uh, to a process of emancipation, I think that that's important. And then, of course, obviously, when you have different groups, it's also very important to have solidarity amongst each other, right? To have these moments mm -hmm. that you can work cross-sectional and that you can interact with each other. Um, so it should not be a question of islands, but uh, people should have the space and the possibility to self-organize. And then later on, you start building those bridges. Um, and I think that could be a possible solution. Hmm. And Lyle, anything to add from what can uh, the world of academia learn from the world of, of business and the other way around on LGBT workplace inclusion? Well, I think the uh, business world has made big strides, right, into organizing LGBTIQ employees uh, or even uh, directing um, uh, advertisements to customers um, and creating, in, in that sense, visibility for uh, these issues within the companies. They, they have taken big steps, and sometimes I feel within higher education institutions, as a, as a gay person myself, uh, studying at a university, um, I, I felt it was a, a relatively inclusive place in the sense that I could be open about my sexuality, but uh, LGBTIQ emancipation was not always very visible uh, within uh, the institution in terms of uh, what kind of, I studied political science, so on itself that's like a, a perfect topic 
to spend attention to social movements, uh, just like the LGBTIQ movement. But I feel that uh, there's still some yeah, work to do in terms of creating vis visibility uh, surrounding this issue in higher education institutions. And that is visibility, so you mentioned on the curriculum, I hear, but also in other areas? When you're a student, yeah. what kind of visibility would you like to see at the university? I think there's many things that you can do, in, indeed, in terms of curricula. So uh, why not, mm -hmm. uh, if you look at political science, teach and, and you have classes about social movements, why not teach about the LGBTIQ movement? If we have history classes, why not, you know, uh, have some space left for the history of LGBTIQ emancipation? If it's about human rights, then you can also have an obvious approach to that. Um, when it comes to teachers, um, why not have seminars on enabling those teachers uh, that are teaching, sorry, uh, students that are becoming teachers, why not enable uh, classes where they can have the instruments to discuss these kind of t topics in the classes uh, at high school. That's when it comes to curricula, but also I think more simple things like uh, why uh, universities could, or higher education, University of Applied Sciences, they could participate in a Pride Month and have a rainbow flags. Um, there's all sorts of, also uh, when I look, for example, at well-being, um, there's many ideas that, is, that I have when I look at well-being of students, LGBTIQ students, uh, we know of that sometimes they, because of stigma or all sorts of issues, are struggling with mental well-being. So uh, when mm -hmm. it comes to the, the student, the, the people that are like guiding the students, the psychologists that are present at university, maybe they could also be trained on how to deal, be sensitive towards issues relating to uh, LGBTI inclusion. So there's many, many things that higher education institutions could do. Uh, and I think many of those things are not, not all of the opportunities that are out there uh, are being uh, used just yet. Mm -hmm. Anneke, maybe what has already been done in Utrecht of, of, of the, several of the things that Lyle mentioned? And I saw your hand go up. Well, the, I, I, I the really pride flag. <laughs> Well, for, yeah, for us it was really important moments that we raised the flag on coming out day uh, together with the uh, Hogeschool Utrecht, so the Applied Sciences um, uh, Institution in Utrecht, but also together with the Dean who had his coming out also to, to show the world. And so for us it's a very, it's maybe a minor thing, but symbolically it's a very important issue. So at every single building of the universities, we have 85 buildings, we, we set out the flag, so um, I think people felt very welcome and it was a big signal that we support this um, group of people who are very important, that they are acknowledged and inclusive in our society. But at the same time, I completely agree that there's so much more to do. Uh, mm -hmm. And the way forward, I mean, can be many, many things. Um, but the discussions at the moment are quite fierce. I also have to mention that. For example, if you compare to the Black Lives Matter, we have exactly the same um, request on education program, on including the discussions in, in training, and et cetera, et cetera. So I think there are many things to do and we need to find a way to combine the things and that people are having discussion groups well, it's either on LGBTI or on uh, Black Lives Matter or discrimination, whatever, but that, that the, the ultimate goal is inclusion for everybody. Um, but Yes, I agree. We can still do more. And are the discussions at, at the board level at universities or is it more at the level below that where things are being executed? So does it no, really think, come? So go well, ahead. it becomes effective only, I think, if it's at both levels. So bottom up, as was said, that the initiatives have to also to come from the working floor or students. And I think that's the big, big strength of universities where it is done like that, where students they are young, they have ideas, they're agile, so they, they really take initiatives, and I think we have to completely support that. At the same time, you need the top of, of faculties, of, of universities to support that and to give signals to, to inside and outside worlds that it is important and that we are supportive. So you have to do both. Uh, I'm completely uh, convinced by that, yeah. So, so it, it, you know, I'm sorry, go ahead, on the show. Yeah, I can only speak about Utrecht. We really yeah. try to talk. So I think the at the top is really important. Jorjanneke, you're sitting in the middle. <laughs> so we heard from the yeah. top and, and also what was happening at the student level. So how is that viewed yeah. uh, when you're on the faculty, when you're a professor? 
Um, I, I can I can get to that next. I just want to uh, respond to Anitje and Lyle because I think indeed um, you need that conversation right between all the different levels. Uh, and the diversity office has a very important function there. And when I uh, think about how it's organized at Leiden University, what seems to work very well is that the diversity office is placed not within the HR department, but uh, directly below the board. So collectively, uh, directly below the Collège van Bestuur. Uh, and that I think helps at least to give this, this view that it's not just about who are we and letting enter the, the organization, but also about inclusion and not just about uh, who is there, but also about what are we teaching. Uh, and so I think that is a very important thing to keep in mind. And what I also uh, like at Leiden is that it's a scientist who's heading the diversity office. And at least mm -hmm. that helps uh, to connect to research issues, um, but maybe less so to HR issues, I'm not sure. So what's the, what's the position of the person uh, in charge of person? Charge, I think is also good one uh, to keep in mind. But yeah, where is your diversity office located and what are its responsibilities and uh, what are they allowed to do, I think, are important issues to consider. Uh, what I still see missing in many places is that it seems to be very hard to reach the middle level. So actually the faculty level, right, that, that is including me, the yeah. teachers uh, and how to conduct themselves in their classes, how to uh, critically look at their what they're teaching. Um, so the middle management. So the background say. noise. Can I suggest the speakers say go on mute, but when you're not speaking, maybe you go on mute. So, so Lyle and Anna, I know it's a bit of a hassle, but uh, it, it does reduce the background noise. So, you know, Janneke, you do continue and maybe uh, Annetje and Lyle go on mute for the time yeah, being. Yeah, the last, uh, I, I just uh, mean to say that uh, the middle management, so to speak, in universities, I think, uh, and that is the, the faculty, they are mm -hmm. the ones mostly influencing their students, right? Uh, and they yes. also make up a large part of the organization. And how do you make sure that the diversity policy that is so uh, nicely thought up uh, at the top that it also really is enacted at that level. That I think is a real challenge. And what, what, why exactly is it so, so hard? Because in the end, I think the ideas do need to come from the faculty themselves. It, it's, it's often comes from a special task force within the faculty that then mm -hmm. talks to the diversity office about what they're going to do, what the goals are for the coming period, et cetera, in line with the strategic aims of the university. Um, but how it actually then is enacted by individual faculty members from assistant professors to full professors, uh, associate uh, faculty. I think, yeah, that, that's still a step that needs to be taken. I only work uh, at Leiden and in Utrecht, but I don't see that enough yet. This is also connected what, what kind of what drives uh, faculty members. So they want to have tenure and is their support for a DNI policy um, is that one of the elements in getting tenure? Yeah, that could I just, be. I don't know, but I'm just throwing it out as part of the discussion. We see already some change in what is being rewarded, right? Some important mm -hmm. changes are happening there that we tend to already at least acknowledge that team science is important. We shouldn't just be individuals doing our science, that we um, need to also reward teaching in addition to doing good research. And um, I don't see any uh, KPIs on diversity and inclusion. I don't think that that's yet something that we're being uh, held accountable for. That might already happen in some organizations, so we can perhaps uh, learn from that. Um, yeah, but I think it's worth it. We need to yeah. uh, be far more engaged. And we need more ambassadors, right? And also a lot of allies who uh, are constantly reminding their colleagues of these issues as being important. Which means we can't just have L LGBTI people um, associated with the networks. We also need allies who actively contribute. Yes. And the allies, of course, they are far more powerful in really determining the culture mm. as an organization. Um, well, they, they, they tend to be greater in number. So that could be a reason exactly. why. Yeah. Exactly. Lyle, any views from, from your side on this? 
Well, what I think it, that is very important is also that we have these LGBT groups, right? It's academics that are organizing, maybe students that are organizing, um, because at the end, the expertise is uh, 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 the best at people who are going through uh, being LGBT and who, who and they know best uh, in their local communities, in their universities, in their universities of applied science, what's necessary. And then, uh, of course, it's really important to have at the faculty level and at the uh, central board level of the university um, uh, board members that support these kind of inclusive policies, but the initiatives also have to come very much from the community itself. So this is also a task for all the LGBT IQ people within higher education to organize. Um, and for example, something uh, at the uh, UVA, we had a, a LGBT IQ, it was a, a Q group, a student group, it was called ASVG. And I think they're mm -hmm. now also working towards like being like a little bit more political in the sense that they are actually coming up with proposals on how you could uh, shape LGBT inclusion within the higher education institutions. Whereas in the beginning days, it used to be more of a group where people could meet each other and could have some drinks. Um, but this process of not good. just like being cozy together, but also like thinking about how we can make real policies uh, that will really improve the standards, uh, I think when it comes to inclusion, uh, I think that's really uh, important. And what kind of policies would they see changed? Or Yeah, so uh, we talked a little bit about curricula, right? So that you make sure that these yeah. curricula are inclusive and diverse. Um, and we have the Oplines Committee. So these are basically like the commissions that concern themselves with how uh, the curricula uh, uh, are designed. So there we could uh, have a look. I think there's many, many possibilities to give the LGBT emancipation movement a place within curricula, especially at the social science faculties or, um, or at the humanities faculties. Um, uh, but elsewhere as well. We should also look, I think, sometimes at the culture with, uh, within student organizations. Some of them have a really heavy drinking culture, sometimes also a little bit of a heteronormative culture. So uh, especially for the boys, uh, yeah. yeah, for the boys, like if you are a first year student and you really want to belong to a student community, then these are often, in many cities, these are the only places you feel you can go to to make a network in this exciting period of your life. But if the conversations that are going on at these drinks are only about uh, well, heterosexuals and, and guys like talking about God knows what they want to do with the girls, then that's not really an environment where many LGBTIQ people feel, feel comfortable. So having this dialogue also with these organizations uh, could be an important step supporting um, LGBTIQ student and academics organizations. And when it comes to trans inclusion, for example, the issue of uh, bathrooms uh, has been uh, addressed uh, very often. Uh, and uh, I don't know, uh, it's not ne not necessary to make all bathrooms gender neutral, but at least to have, besides the uh, general male and female bathrooms and ability, the possibility yep. for uh, trans people or non-binary people to go to a neutral bathroom uh, should also mm -hmm. exist. So there's many, many, many policies that I could think of. And uh, it's a lot better if there's like, locally at a university or at the University of Applied Science, a group that uh, of students and academics that organize themselves and based on local need can address issues to board members rather than like having a whole list that we send to board members and, and they just need to implement it, right? So I think it's really good to have that local organization and that's a start from any kind of good policy to be designed. Great, thank you. Anitje. Yeah, about, I think that's a very nice example about gender neutral uh, sanitary facilities, yeah. where I think that is unique for university. What we did is um, we said we, we are in favor of that, but we want to make sure how our community is responding and what is really needed. So we combined a pilot with a research project by students and uh, members of the faculty, where we also uh, studied the behavior of people and what was the effect of, of this uh, facility. So there yeah. you see, to convince the community in a university, it's very helpful if you at the same time can show the research, but that they also involve the researchers of your own community. And I think that was also one of the other examples where this is a sort of circle where you can convince people through your own uh, métier, so to say, which is research. So. In the end, so we had the outcome of that uh, research and we decided to have certain locations where we have the general neutral facilities, where, which means that we have implemented it rather quickly, but with all the support of the uh, research. So I think that's a nice example where you can combine things as an uh, educational research institution. 
So really evidence-based policies, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and, and some of the other points that Lyle mentioned, um, so not only about the gender neutral toilets. Um, any response there? Um, well, maybe about, you said, what, why are so we are maybe different as a university uh, to other corporate institutions? And um, one of the things mentioned was what we call opleidings uh, committees. Yeah. So uh, to introduce uh, educational changes, of course, it has to go through a a system which is uh, legalized or institutionalized where you have special committees. So you need the support of certain uh, gremia in our institution because it's the way we work. Um, mm -hmm. And so you can't just, yeah, one side to change things or top down, you say, well, you have to do this and that. No, because we have a different institutional framework where we have to live with. Uh, and of course, the wishes of everybody is quite rich. So... <laughs> Uh, this, this takes time. So in that sense, we are different and we have to take that into account. But at the same time, if you have initiatives from the, the ground floor and people think, well, we can start a pilot or we, we just have a tryout, then there's enormously many possibilities. So I think you have to make the combination of uh, sort of uh, experiments at the same, and at the same time try to get the results there and to institutionalize it through the channels we have for that type of, of uh, changes. Mm -hmm. uh, but th that's why we may be different than just a shoe factory or something, yeah. So, yeah. but on the point that universities and colleges or the Hogeschool or the University of Applied Science, that they train uh, many teachers who then become teachers in high schools. And there they face issues about how to deal on with LGBTI. Uh, and, and the situation today is those teachers are not well equipped to deal with these questions. And so they avoid it altogether. Um, is that a good summary, Lyle, where we are? Yes. Yeah, so so yeah. how do you address that issue in particular? Because I, yeah, I hear from you, you know, yeah. this can all be changed over time, yeah. dynamics at universities. Um, but this would be, if you really want to make a societal contribution, this would be a game changer. Yeah. Now, I, the word game changer, I like. I, normally, I use the words, we are agents agents to change. And I think yeah. we have, as a public institution, with public interest, uh, we have to show the world, uh, not only teach it and, and research it, but also show that we do ourselves the best effort. And through education, of course, we can make a lot of difference and make sure that our students, but also our teachers, uh, and people be educated, but also the teachers who teach, huh? uh, yeah. make sure that our norms and values are incorporated in that program. So yes, it's a game changer, and therefore we're also different, so we are agents to change. And that also relates to other issues like uh, sustainability or gender or uh, Black, Black Lives Matter. So, um, But then you have to find a balance, because we also have freedom of speech, freedom of thought, and yes, you have different views on different things. And you have to, to make sure that uh, the values you educate are in that same framework. Lyle, a quick, quick response on this one, because you brought up uh, you know, the training yeah. the teacher, what to say. Um, yeah, uh, I think that's uh, really important that we do make an effort to make sure that these uh, teachers feel comfortable educating class. And like the teacher studies that are one of the studies that have like the most amount of students, right? Because so many teachers need to be prepared. On the issue of freedom of speech, um, I think there's one important thing. Of course, every student and every teacher has uh, freedom of speech, so we cannot limit that. But um, uh, last year or two years ago, we had this issue of the Nashville Declaration, uh, which was a declaration that was not having, uh, to say the least, very homophobic content into it. It was important from the United States and translated into Dutch. It was signed by several uh, Orthodox Christian members of parliament. Uh, and it was also signed, for example, by an academic uh, at the uh, VU University, the uh, Vrije Universiteit, Free University in Amsterdam. Um, so in that specific case, the board decided to intervene, uh, or at least to talk with this teacher, because the content of the, uh, uh, of the, of the issue of the declaration was so uh, homophobic that I can hardly imagine that if you were to be a student in the class of such a professor and you would see that your professor signs up to this kind of declaration, you would feel comfortable to talk about your sexuality in the same way your heterosexual peers would do uh, in a class of that kind of professor. So 
Uh, there is freedom of speech, but I also believe that academics, especially, uh, have this public role and need to provide a safe environment for all uh, students to work in. And uh, of course, if we would have um, uh, freedom of speech in that sense without any limits, um, uh, uh, then I think there might be an issue that arises uh, exactly at these moments when an academic uh, speaks out uh, with very homophobic content. Uh, and of course, as a student, uh, I would absolutely not feel comfortable being in the class of that professor, but this is the person that's going to grade you. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, in the same way, you, you do have like com some kind of public uh, responsibility as a professor to, or as a, uh, 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 yeah, especially if you're teaching, you have a public responsibility to make sure that all your students feel comfortable in your class and that there is no reason for your students to think that based on characteristics like sexual orientation, you will be dis discriminated against. Yeah, that, that's um, freedom of speech. Yeah, I said within the framework, which I mean, yeah. uh, is that it has not be non, it mustn't be discriminating. Yeah? So there are values you have to balance, but there's certainly many, many limits to that. Yeah? So freedom to speak doesn't mean you can discriminate in the sense within our institution. And that's, I think, an important. So I completely agree with that, just to make sure. Yeah. Yo, Yannick, I saw your hand go up. And I can't remember exactly um, where, but do jump in. <laughs> let's see. Oh, yes. I think um, it's about the curriculum and how we can make diversify it. So I think mm -hmm. what's also really unique about our higher education is that the fact that we have students who need to uh, be taught how to critically engage with material, we have also a tremendous opportunity to let them diversify our curriculum. Um, it would be a, a great uh, yeah, uh, assignment to ask your students, well, this is what I've figured out about this topic and this is what I'm asking you to read. Can you uh, look for other sources? What can you come up with? What are different perspectives? How might I uh, be mono, have a, have a certain very single-minded view on this? And it could become part of the learning experience. It doesn't need to mean that you then take all of that as truth or that it becomes your curriculum. But I think there are a lot of opportunities there that you might not have in other types of organizations. So, yeah. And I also agree with Anitje, of course, that's just the law. Uh, organizations have an obligation to provide a discrimination-free environment. And that is one of the limits. Um, we often forget that that is an obligation rather that, than something that we do uh, out of the, the good of our heart. So. so to kind of revisit this topic of academic freedom um, and freedom of thought, uh, there was an interesting article which actually came from a professor at Leiden University who said, well, if we hire faculty, we should only hire on quality. Um, and this is actually kind of not being supported by an active DNI uh, policy. So then we undermine our quality uh, assessment and our quality objective. Any views on that statement? <laughs> well, I already disagree that these things are mutually exclusive, right? That quality uh, does not equate to diversity and inclusion. So that is one point where I certainly disagree. I actually think it allows us to um, increase our quality because we give ourselves new opportunities uh, to find people that we would have overlooked otherwise and to add the different perspectives possibly to uh, our arsenal. At the same time, I agree, this was Professor Cluteur, I believe. Uh, I believe, uh, I agree with him that um, diversity uh, that uh, tends to be focused on, uh, nece it doesn't necessarily equate to more uh, different perspectives, right? So if we tend to focus on relatively visible forms of diversity, that doesn't necessarily mean that all these people that look different bring in new perspectives. And that's, I think, an important thing to realize. Uh, and so we also need to look at more broad diversity, including based on sexual orientation and gender identity, but also diversity of thought. Now, he would say we only need to focus on diversity of thought. I would say it's also important to focus on that. So that's where there is a difference there, but at the same time also focus on the representation of historically underrepresented groups. And it's not mm. only the right thing to do, it's also the smart thing to do uh, because yes. yeah, more diversity is more opportunity. And, and um, yeah, very much. Oh, Lyle, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. 
uh, I very much agree with that. And uh, sometimes we have this uh, idea that if you do not have specific issues oriented at diversity or inclusion, that then you have some kind of meritocratic system, right? That people are only uh, uh, based on, uh, uh, on well, uh, on objective criteria. But I think in the reality, if there's no inclusion or diversity policy, what we see is that certain groups are systematically underrepresented. And this is going on for decades. And if we don't do anything about it, it will go on like that for a long time to come. So uh, the idea that uh, the current system that doesn't take into account specific policies, of inclusion, diversity, that it would be solely based on meritocratic criteria is simply unjust because yeah. it leaves out the reality that there is many prejudices that exist or many kind of um, uh, systematic elements that cause inequality. There is no meritocracy right now. That's the bottom line, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Anneke, anything to, to add from, from your side? Then well, I'll... It's beautifully oh. said, so I don't have to... <laughs> I do completely agree. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, I think it's time to go over the questions. And we have Mike, who has been very busy getting all the questions. I see like uh, tens of them, you know, dozens of them. Um, so, Mike, over to you. All right. Uh, first question we have is from Jorit or Jorit, and uh, this person is asking: uh, Is there any data available on representation of LGBTQI on the work floor that's comparable to gender or other minority representation that is perhaps more visible? Mm -hmm. I think a good question maybe for your Janneke, and, and yeah. the next one will take for for I Lyle because I know you leave it on board. But your Janneke, take this one, please. Yeah, I saw the question. Um, I'm actually not aware of research where all the different categories that we tend to distinguish have been um, asked. Uh, we do so in the Global Employee Survey in collaboration with Workplace Pride. Uh, there might be uh, some data in the FRA research, which is uh, European in nature, but many organizations, including universities, I don't think include questions like this in their uh, MTO their satisfaction survey, certainly not in their personnel files. So at most, it would be a sample of the organization where you can get some sense of it. And would you recommend, Jannike, that universities consider doing this? Yeah, I think, of course, to be uh, in line with the GDPR, you'd have to be very careful about it. It has to be based on uh, voluntariness, etc. Yeah. Yeah. I certainly think that it's important to at least do it once in a while, not just to know the diversity, uh, so not just to know the numbers, but especially also to see if uh, there are particular needs, if the sense of inclusion among certain groups of employees differ from majority groups and, and to know where you stand as an organization and where you really need to focus your attention. Great, thanks. A quick question yeah. for Lyle. Well, maybe just to add to this, because we have many, many problems to collect the data. It, even if it's yeah. voluntarily, it's very, very tough to, to store and analyze data without uh, privacy issues. So, so far, we have been very, very reluctant to do that. It's just, so maybe some research can help you, but uh, yeah. it's, only for, it's for many, many different groups in your organization. So I, I really encountered many troubles and uh, negative advices to do so. Yeah, it's one focus of my research. So hopefully in a few years, we'll have an answer. But also we have another webinar coming up with Workplace Pride from the tech uh, platform. That's also uh, about this issue Yeah. in November, I believe. 16th of November. Okay. <laughs> Mike. Okay, the question next question. Lyle. Yes. Uh, for Lyle. Okay, so Dirk is asking about the subject of visibility and says it would be great to have role models. Where are the openly gay lesbian top scientists? Uh, he asks. Sometimes it seems it is easier for an Olympic champion to come out than for a top <laughs> scholar. And uh, he says he's taken his experience from Delft. Mm -hmm. Over to Lyle, please. Yeah. Uh, well, I can definitely uh, relate to that. And I think without role models, without people feeling comfortable to speak out, uh, uh, you can also not inspire others to do the same. So uh, role models feel in any kind of process of emancipation, role models that feel comfortable to speak out 
um, uh, are extremely important. I remember one of my favorite movies is Milk, uh, and it kind of uh, uh, it is, it takes a setting of San Francisco in the 70s and all over the United States. There were referenda that were on whether or not uh, LGBT people should be uh, allowed to uh, be in front of classes and the LGBT movement across the entire country uh, was losing it. And then there's at some setting, uh, setting the same kind of referendum in California and Harvey Milk, who was an activist, an LGBTIQ activist, sits in a room with the activists. They're all like uh, a little bit desperate on how they're going to relate to things. And he say, now you need to call uh, any kind of person you know, your family member, your brothers, your sister, and tell them you're, that you're gay. You have to come out. If you want to win this battle, uh, this is what you have to do. And then later in the movie, you see that they indeed win uh, the referendum. So I think coming out uh, isn't a really important uh, uh, thing. But we should also realize that not for everybody, it's as easy to come out. People can have sometimes families that are uh, struggling with this. Uh, maybe they are uh, in a very heteronormative environment where it's not so easy or where it will maybe harm their relations in some kind of way. Or they, will, uh, do not, they have these kind of expectations about the reaction of their environment and that will make them feel uncomfortable. So in that sense, it's always difficult because role models are uh, like are kind of a condition uh, to be uh, to create emancipation. But on the other hand, if there's no safe environment, it will be difficult for role models to search and to speak out. Um, so, but somebody needs to take a first back, a step, and I, I would only encourage people uh, to do so. Mm -hmm. Now I have to go uh, because we're having actions on the housing market, so uh, it's a busy week. But I also want to uh, express my gratitude for being here today because it's uh, very nice to be able to talk about this issue as well. Lyle, great having you there and good luck with the good work. Okay, thank you thank very you. much. Bye. Um, maybe, Aditi, you want to respond? Are there enough out faculty members at the Dutch universities? Well, I find that difficult to say, but I think in general, probably not. Um, just, just to add to that, um, we have a professor in what we call uh, Homer Studies, and mm -hmm. he's with, and John is very uh, prominent in, in not only his research, and, and, and but also in the way he, he supports the inclusiveness and the actions within our university. So I think he is a role model, very modest. Yeah because he's a modest person, but very, very... So he, his influence in an informal way, I think, is huge and uh, is always uh, there to help. So there are role models, but maybe not in such an explicit way or shouting it from the roof. But also when we had a coming out day where we had a dean who was a, a willing to, to do the flag and, and really raise it and make yeah show, show the world who he was. So, yes, there are many, many nice examples. but. Um, Probably we need much more now. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Mike. Any more questions? Many, many questions. But um, just to speak back to what you were discussing earlier, Paul is asking about LGBTI policies and are they ever a topic, a distinct topic, on the agenda of university boards as they are with corporate boards? So, could you speak a little bit more in detail to that? I assume that. That the question is for me. Yes. <laughs> um, well, I can say that at our board, uh, diversity and inclusion is a very, very important topic. So we have many, many discussions around that. And um, whether this is for special interest groups, I don't say yes, because it's we really try to, to help everybody and to get an inclusive community. So I think it's fair to say that we may want to uh, stress this issue more. But for example, we did that, for example, with for students with um, disabled or special needs. Um, we have gender, we have LGTB. So it's on once in a while issues are coming up and we make the policy, but it is not on the agenda all the time. Um, so maybe Juliana has advises on that and we should do more. But as an executive, I'm a bit reluctant to give really priority to one special group. We really try to, to make sure that everybody getting place on the table. So this is the same dilemma as I mentioned before. Yeah, this is not a challenge. I think that is only there for universities. I think it's broader than that. At the same time, uh, the research that is there does suggest that having an identity blind approach, which it sounds like uh, uh, what you're communicating where uh, inclusion is about everybody and everybody's equal, tends to uh, not have the intended effect 
when it comes to minority groups. So majority groups like that approach because it sounds uh, benevolent, but for groups that really struggle to be visible, it's very important that they are specifically addressed in their specific identity. And of course, intersectionality is very important that we also take into account, but we need to uh, make sure that at least sometimes we have special attention. And we already do that, right? Because raising the rainbow flag is one such uh, example. Um, all gender toilets is another. Um, transition leave could be another. I don't think that's on the table at the moment. How to address students uh, when uh, they would like to be addressed with different pronouns than what is in their uh, student profile. All these things, I think, uh, maybe should not necessarily be a decision by the CVB, but should be uh, addressed and because they're very specific and important. And we have policy like that already, but we just forgot that it's uh, identity specific, right? Like maternity leave uh, is uh, specific to um, people giving birth uh, and, uh, and requiring time off for that. That's also a very specific group. So I think that I totally understand the challenge that you don't want um, yeah, there to be individual policies. Um, but I think if we try to think of a more individual focused uh, policy approach, then we might also be able to cater to smaller groups of uh, our employees and students. So I do think it's a challenge that we cannot just yeah, negate. We have, to, uh, we have to take it even though it might be a bumpy road. Um, and I think that, yeah, listening to the groups themselves, they often have uh, very good ideas about his, how this can be uh, achieved, also in collaboration with other interest groups in the university, I think. Thank you. Mike, another... Oh, so, Anna, you want to respond to that first? Yeah, go ahead. No, there was one issue which was very important, a new issue for me preparing yes. this, um, this webinar, was that you mentioned, but also maybe somebody else, about the risk students have when they go abroad for international exchange, mm, where yes. the environment is less favor of LGBTI, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. For me, that was really an eye opener. And that might be, for example, an example where I think, oh, wow, we need more action or more eh, uh, carefulness about the policy and what we're actually doing. Mm. And uh, that might be an individual approach towards the broader inclusiveness yeah. uh, issue. So, that for me was an example where I think, oh yeah, we need specific action and taking more care about that mm -hmm. as an example. Yeah. Yeah, good and point. this is also a really great example uh, of why it's so important to be a member of organizations like Workplace Pride, because this is exactly the thing that many of the Workplace Pride members struggle with, but also have solutions for, like uh, mm -hmm. Buitenlandse Zaken, right, foreign affairs, but also the yes. multinationals that send employees abroad. It's very uh, similar, I think. And we can learn from each other. Yeah, exactly. Good, thank you. I'm over to Mike for some final questions. Okay, final we have, minute. yes, uh, we have a question. Uh, how should an inclusion policy aimed at LGBTQI differ from other diversity policies? Uh, what specific policies should there be for this community specifically? Will I take that? Go ahead. Yeah, please. I think... Um, off the top of my head, I think the all gender toilets is one specific one. I think uh, uh, parental leave could be another. There's some, been some changes there, uh, which is already important, but probably much more needs to happen. I think transition leave is one. It is only going to be a very small group of people who require it, but it's very important that they know what's out there for them, what's possible, and to feel supported by their uh, direct supervisor. Um, in terms of students, well, we've just discussed it, right? Students going abroad. Um, those are different issues, I think, than uh, other groups of uh, students and employees might require. And I also think that since the, the stigma is, or the, the identity is somewhat concealable, right? You cannot always see uh, from the outside what a person's gender identity or sexual orientation is. The challenge in that respect is also different from uh, certain uh, visible characteristics like skin color, for example. And that doesn't mean to say that it's worse, but there are, there are different challenges there. And one is about knowing the diversity within your community. 
uh, it's harder to get a handle on that when it comes mm. to this. Mike, the very fine final question. Final question. Must be a good uh, one. Uh, Paul asks, is it rewarding to be an ambassador or ally within a faculty? <laughs> I'm an ambassador for the uh, LGBTQA plus uh, employee network at Leiden University. I find it very mm -hmm. rewarding. Um, On a personal but level. If it really helps, I don't know. So, yeah, I like to do it. Uh, but, um, uh, of course, I don't know if I'm, I'm actually making a difference. Um, I know that our Dean uh, of Social Sciences is also an ambassador. I think that's an even more important one. He's also a role model. So, yes. um, so there is that. Uh, the allies that I've spoken to in other organizations of the Workplace Pride uh, Foundation, uh, yeah, I tend to only hear positive things. Uh, at the same time, I think it's also important that these networks are a safe haven to LGBTQI plus people themselves, right? So. Um, there should also be activity specifically uh, for the community. Uh, but I do think that it's our way of being able to um, offset the service burden, I think, for LGBTQI plus mod role models. It's the one thing that we can do to offset that a little bit uh, mm -hmm. and to make sure that uh, they're not the only ones doing the work. But I think talking about rewarded, so... I know that university professors traditionally oh financially you mean publish a lot etc they get promoted they get tenure are you ah. also rewarded in that sense no I, I think that relates to the earlier issue right of um, I think it probably depends on the direct supervisor so I could imagine that some people are are told well we all do our service and you get some hours a week to do this I'm not mm -hmm. actually aware of that for me of course it's also Part of I would do it anyway, but it's also very connected to my professorship, so it's logical that I that I do it. It's a good point. I think as much, uh, yeah, attention should be on that as uh, on the intrinsic motivation to make sure people have the time to do it. Anetje, <laughs> some final words from you before we wrap up. Well, some reflections on the discussion today. On reflection general, well. Uh, I think it's really good that we as organizations get a mirror to look into and listen to the community and ask what do, can we do better or what are things we overlooked. So for me, this is a very learning, very good experience to learn more and to, to start a discussion uh, even uh, further. So um, I think it's really good that we have organizations like you to, to have those discussions. Great, thank you, thank you. So um, I would like to invite everybody for a follow-up uh, webinar and it will be focusing on querying the curriculum and it will be scheduled sometimes later in, in the year. But I can first announce that our next webinar will be on September the 10th at 1 p.m. and that will be on LGBTI people of color in the workplace. I would like to thank our panel. Thank you very much for participating. I would like to thank the staff. We've done all the work here, so thank you so much. And I would like to think, thank all the participants for staying with us. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.